What is going on, everyone? Welcome on into Open Ice Hits Episode 4. There was a bomb dropped on me, what, two days ago? Yesterday? I'm losing track of days. But what the Montreal Canadiens did, wow, stunner. Durso, your initial reaction to the news, Claude Julian out of town. You know, I don't know if I was overly surprised with the Claude Julian news because I'd heard some things kind of bubbling under the surface there about it. You know what really surprised me? Kirk Muller goes with him. That surprised me because I think, you know, I got a, obviously covering the Flyers. I got a really good idea of those two with the playoff series. And Claude Julian had some health issues and was not able to coach the team during that playoff series. So Kirk Muller took, took over and I was fully expecting that they were kind of grooming him to be a guy who could jump in and be a head coach at some point. He seemed like he was a fit for the job. But that being said, I mean, the guy who they've named is interim coach has a lot of experience as a head coach. He coached the Canadian junior teams all those years. And he's a right, you know, he's a Ducharme is a rising coach in this league. So I think that that's going to help them. But I was surprised by it. You know, Mark Bergevin knows how to keep things interesting in the course of a season. So I'm, you know, I'm surprised by it because they are in a playoff spot at the moment. They were going into the day and everything seemed like it was lining up the right way for them to continue to build on the season they had. But this happens over the course of a year when things just start to go sour in one way or another. You you tend to point to the coaches for one reason or another. And I think they were just looking for a change behind the bench. But it was surprising. I mean, I, I literally I think it happened so early in the morning. I woke up to the news and I was just surprised by it just to see. You know, because I, I think there were a lot of people that had other ideas for who could possibly be the first head coach to go in the middle of a year like this. And don't think anybody said Claude Julian is one of them, though. So I think that that was the shock of it. Yeah, I agree with you. Look, they ended up playing the Ottawa Senators a couple games in a row. And Ottawa squeaks one out. A couple, they squeaked both out. But the Canadians still got a point. They were still factoring into those games. And I remember even saying this to you when we were breaking down the North Division for our first episode. And you, you said you weren't surprised that this Canadians team took a massive jump considering what they did in the bubble last year. And while I recognize that they were going to be trending in the right direction, I just thought that that was such an extreme leap. So was it more of Claude Julian not getting the most out of the team right now? Or was it they overachieved so early that your expectations became so unfair and unrealistic that you held Claude Julian to this insane high level that wasn't what they were, if that makes sense? Yeah, I think it's a little bit of both. I think that there's, you know, they were playing a lot of the teams that were lower than them in the standings early on. I think there's a lot, you know, one of the comments I think I saw on Twitter, one of the, you know, analysis pieces of it that I saw was you can't play Vancouver every game. So Van <laughs> playing Vancouver a lot kind of built up their standings placement. And I get that, but I like their team. That's the thing. I like their team. They've got some young players who continue to develop. Nick Suzuki's going to be a great player in this league for years to come. And I like where they're going with it. And I think about their defensive core too, because they have three pieces that I really like. I think I, we talked about this in the very first episode that Shea Weber's had this resurgence and has come back better than ever. And, you know, you add in Sherratt and, and Petrie and you get these guys who are doing things that are better every year. They continue to just progress and they continue to add to the back end in, in that way. And obviously they've got carry price and goals, so they always have a shot. It, it, it's just that's what I think is surprising is that on paper, their team continues to get better. You know, I, I we talked about Toffoli as well. You know, look at that addition and what he's been able to do for them on, on the offensive side. And all of a sudden it's like everything just stopped in its place. Everything they had done to this point in the season, it's like starting over almost. And granted, they're in a playoff position, which is good for them, but it is like starting over to an extent because now you've got to go and, and pick back up and kind of pick up the pieces and see where you go from here. And I'm sure it rattled the team a little bit too, because I don't think that they probably expected it. And, you know, like I said, Mark Bergman keeps things interesting though. And, and, and that's what he's been doing here. He's just, I think he's keeping everything in balance here. And, you know, maybe, you know, Claude Julian given everything, because I, I saw a lot of people going, oh, he'll never get another job or he'll get one really quick because he's that kind of head coach in the league. He's got that reputation. I wouldn't be surprised. And, and Montreal already said that they are not going to hire anybody in place of the interim for the rest of the year. I wouldn't be surprised if Claude Julian just takes the rest of the year off too, given everything that he went through with the health issues during the bubble and everything like that. Like, take some time have some time off, reflect on some things and come back and, and get back into the right situation, you know, and the right situation could very well be 
something like a Seattle situation because now he's a free agent on this market and Seattle still doesn't have a head coach. So that's going to be something that's a dynamic to watch out for as well. So, but from Montreal side of things, it's just a surprise. I think it's just this, it, it came from out of nowhere, I think to in a lot of ways. And even though there was word going around that there were some things happening behind the scenes that we weren't really sure about and that there was talk about this, I, I'm, I still found it to be a surprise. And that's the thing. I think that that's, you know, it's it's that it's what happens when, you know, I guess that this is what happens in a shortened season. You have expectations. You want to be one of these teams that makes it. It's not the same thing as what you went through a year ago. I mean, they did make the playoffs and they made a little bit of a run for them, which because that's because they were 12th in the conference. So they were a 12 seed. But now you have to be one of the top four in your division and they're playing in a division of seven. So they have a fair shot. But I think if anything started to go sour, I think that's why they made the move is because they know the significance of trying to continue to build on this season. And now that they've hit a bit of a rough patch, they're going to try to look for something that sparks the rest of the team. So I think that's what they're going for, and we'll see how it goes. Yeah, I disagree with it completely, though. To me, it's a knee-jerk reaction. The only thing that would make this a good move, in my opinion, or not, not even a good move, but one that I could respect more is – if there was something behind the scenes that was happening that we didn't know about, that we were unaware about, and I'm not going to say that Claude Julian, I, I don't want to put him in this category, but when Babcock was out of Toronto, it was pretty damn clear that there was stuff happening that should not have been happening where you needed to get him out of the room. You just had to. You couldn't have him. He was talking to Mitch Marner and asking about what players work hard, and then he went back and told those players. I mean, it was ridiculous. This is this is so knee jerk reaction ish after a little bit of a downfall. Look, we can see this after in any season. In an 82 game season, there's ups and downs. There's flows of five game winning streaks, three game losing skids, eight game winning streaks, three game losing skids. That's just the reality of the situation. Now you bring up it's a 56 game season. So now the margin of error isn't there and especially in a competitive, very competitive North Division. Yeah, it, it's more impactful every time you do have one of those skids. But, man, I, I, I just, I don't get it. I really don't get it. And I wonder if this is more of a GM trying to save his ass with his ass on the line if something was to go sour. Like, is this his last opportunity to keep his job or he thinks Julian's not the guy? So if he's not the guy and I know I'm coming next, I'm going to be out of here if I don't get this thing where I need to, then... I got to make a change. Like, do you think that is in play at all from a GM mindset? Probably a little bit. And I think that has to do with who it is, you know, and I'm and not, not the GM I'm talking about, but the franchise. It, this is the Montreal Canadiens. If you've been out of the picture for a while and then you get in, you make a little bit of a run. People were, you know, that's the thing you about made the a bubble. Good point is they made a run, but they made a run based off of these wonky playoff scenarios that isn't real like it was a it was a fake false little playoff run for him last year they did but see to me it's it's the qualifying round series win that changes that though because you beat the Pittsburgh Penguins in a five game series you win three out of four you move on and then let's be real you kept a six game series against the Flyers very competitive because of that you start to build up some hype around it there were you know I think for a change I, th I think people when the bubble started dismissed the Montreal Canadiens the same way they dismissed the Chicago Blackhawks as a 12 seed on the other side. You dismiss those teams because you go, this is like your participation trophy. I'm just happy to be here. And, and you don't have any expectations whatsoever for those teams. And then they win a series and then they make another series. Interesting. And all of a sudden people are talking about the Montreal Canadiens again. And I think that's where Mark Bergevin is, is that people are talking about this franchise again and having some expectations. And again, the playoff structure, just like last year, is a little bit different. Because it's different, you have a shot. You're among seven teams. All you have to do is be in the top four. You have a shot. And if you think you're better, which I'm sure that looking at the way that the standings were a year ago and everything like that, you're sitting there going, well, probably better than Ottawa. Could be better than some of these other teams with the steps that they took. And I'm sure Bergman looked at some of the guys, you know, like a Toffoli. You bring in a guy like that and you go improvement made now. So take that next step because here's a guy who can help take us to the next level. And the younger players who are taking those steps, I think of, you know, again, I think of Suzuki and Kokaniemi and guys like that. And you go, they will only grow from here. So if they keep growing, 
bring in a guy like let, let me ask they you also, this they also quick. made the uh I, i'm thinking of the i'm also thinking of the domi for josh anderson trade yeah too. yeah yeah, you bring yeah. In a guy who's a fit there too and you go now these are pieces that should help you get better and then and they got off to a hot start and now like i just pulled up their schedule really quick just to look at the recent results and first of all by the way i find it weird that they had a six day break from gameplay when when we know that unlike the u.s teams covid's not really been a big factor in the canadian division at all so in, you know unlike these teams that have had to have their schedules reworked five six times because of covid situations they have not had to had anything reworked but they had a six day off period from games they have two wins in in the month you know that's it pretty much i mean Yes, they, like I think one of them or early on they had two to start the month, but after that they've won two more games. That's it. Well, I was gonna going to ask you this: if if they would have won their last game against the Senators instead of losing in a shootout, if they won that shootout, like if they won that shootout, which is a geeking competition, <laughs> are you telling me that now Claude Julian is there? And that's why I think I'm having an issue here. I think it's because they lost to the Senators two games in a row, and they instead of getting four points, they only got two points out of it. If they won in that last shootout, are we sitting here today having this conversation? And that's what is ridiculous to me because – it's a skills competition at the end. And look, I know you can go through and see that they also lost to the Maple Leafs. And, and you, you're right. When you look at the month of February, it's been a disaster. But that's where I'm kind of looking at it from. The most recent stretch of a three-game losing skid and it being the Ottawa Senators. I, I don't know. I just I find it hard to believe that if they would have won in a shootout. You're firing Claude Julian. And it's that's the margin of error here? Well, look, and I'll bring up a team that I'd heard – a lot of people say this is the first coach that's going to go in this shortened season, which it's not talked about often, but a lot of people talked about how, oh, you know what? With the way things are going for the New York Rangers, that's probably, you know, David Quinn's the guy, first guy that kept coming up when it came to that. And you think about the collective results so far for a team like that and the level of play that they're at at the moment, and you go, there's something to that because now you're 15, 16, 17 games in some, for some teams more than that. And if it's that collective, now a quarter of your season's gone by and it's really not working out, you can understand that it's not a knee-jerk reaction at that point in time. You've let a quarter of your season go by and something needs to change. This is literally, like you said, this is three games back from a six-day off period, three losses, and two of them to Ottawa, one in overtime, one in a shootout, and you're making a change just like that. So I think that that's what, yeah, your point to that is is fair because of the fact that it's happened so quickly. It feels like this went from being a thought like, could they move on from Claude Julian? Could they be thinking about it? To it happened that quickly. So I, I think that's the shocker of it is that I don't even know if people were talking about this as a possibility a week ago. And within a week, it's already happened. And now they're moving on, trying something new. And I don't think they were the team that people expected to make that kind of a move this this early in the season or this season at all for that matter because I think people saw what they were building toward last year and I think they thought that and I did too I think they thought that Claude Julian had a lot to do with that and had a lot to do with their success a year ago and just finding a way to make things interesting in that playoff picture and they were off to a good start this year and I don't you know ask any other team that's in in this season right now is three games going to get your coach fired you know is any of these teams with a high profile head coach like Claude Julian is because of his success throughout his career as a head coach is anybody else getting fired over a three game losing streak if you're still in the running if you still have time to turn it around you know things like that like it's so easy this year to control your own destiny by playing any team twice in a row, three times in a row, and all of a sudden put yourself right back in the picture where you want to be because you win two or three games in a row against a team within your own division. That's the beauty of the divisional play this year is that you can look at a three-game losing streak and go, normally that would kill you, but you have a chance to come right back. You could win three in a row following that and be right back where you were before and be right back in the picture. So that's the thing, and it's like they're not even giving – Claude Julian the chance to be behind the bench to write the situation and go well three game losing streak could turn into something successful in another week or two they're not even giving him that chance they're they're just done so that's what the, I think that's the shock factor is that they're just done and he doesn't even get a chance to correct the situation and get them back where they were
Yeah, I hate it. I absolutely hate it. I think it's a horrendous decision. But look, maybe it's a maybe it's a wake up call to the fellas. I think it's the wrong way to go about things. But there is a, a a big snowball effect when you make such a big statement. You let someone loose like that. It's a wake up call to everybody else involved, the captain of the team, and you know the top tier players. You mentioned Tyler Toffoli, who's been lighting the lamp this season, and and Anderson Suzuki. All these players in the locker room now have a different sense of urgency because they realized that they just snipped their head coach after, you know, a strong start to the season. Big wake-up call. I wonder how they're going to respond. I do think it's just the shock factor will wake everybody up, so I do feel like there will be this kick in the butt, if you will, that first initial big spurt out of the Canadians, and then once that dies down, that new jolt of energy, once that dies down, then you'll see who they really are again. But uh, you brought up the New York Rangers, and I think that's a good transition to to our next topic here. And we watched the Flyers, and, and I think the Flyers are an interesting topic too because they had all these COVID problems, and they had to throw AHL defensemen as forwards on their fourth line. It's just a miserable watch. But Claude Giroux returns for a two-and-a-half-week hiatus and gives you three apples. But how that ties together with Claude Giroux coming back in the Rangers, man, the Rangers stink. When we watched that game last night, they blow. The amount of times that they were throwing the puck out of the stands. They weren't even chipping pucks off the glass. They were just throwing the pucks into the stands as if people were at warm-ups banging on the glass gas for him during warm-ups. Non-stop. I think the Fly- Flyers ended up with eight power plays. Yeah, and you know, now now you're getting into the territory. One of the things that I like about the NHL schedule traditionally is that every team in the league has to make a trip to every city, you know, over the course of an 82 game season. So you get a so I'm lucky enough to typically get a look at every single team in the league that comes through at least for just one game, just to kind of see in person what the, what they look like as compared to watching them from afar. So with this situation, I've now seen this Rangers team in person twice in the last week. And the the game flow is just brutal. How much of it is them. Panarin, though? Like, I, I understand the circumstances are very, very unfortunate, and I'm scared for him. I hope everything works out, honestly. Yeah. Uh, but how much of that just really crushes the morale of what's going on? On top of them not being good this year in general, and, and there were some other storylines with some other players where things got, you know, a little ugly in the locker room or whatever, but... Uh, you know, the Panera news, like, I'm sure their teammates are just as scared on the situation as I am here, and I'm 10,000 feet away from it, so. Yeah, the, the Panarin situation does have something to do with it to an extent. It, well, and I, I say it because, you know, Panarin was their best player when I watched them play the Flyers a week ago. Easily their best player. Probably should have scored twice in regulation anyway. Didn't. Flyers got lucky with the post in that situation. He finally scored in a shootout. Is what it is, but that's beside the point like he's he's definitely the best player but then like I look around at this team they don't really have finishing ability at all you know I'll look and Kreider had a hat trick last night and that's great you know he's a good player I've always liked him I've always liked what he's able to bring and he definitely got the inside positioning a lot to be in the right spots to make those plays I'll get you know and David Quinn said something after the game that I agree with by the way that I think we finally started to see Mika Zibanejad come back to what we're used to from the offensive side because he, I remember going into that game a week ago and I'm writing out the game preview, trying to get everything ready. And I go and I look and I didn't realize that they'd played 14 games and he had three points on the season. I'm going, wait a minute. We're talking about Mika Zibanejad, right? The guy yeah. who had five goals in a game Moose, a though. year ago. You know, you know? Zibanejad might have been there offensively, but Moose was there defensively. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, and and to an extent, because he had two assists last night, so he finally is boosting that point total a little bit. Yeah. But I'm thinking about, you know, and and Buchnevich is a nice player, and he's had some success this year and things like that, but they really just don't have anybody else who has stepped into that role, you know, like, and I, I, we've talked about top picks before and things like that. Lafreniere is not showing me anything right now, and, it, and, there's, and, and here's the difference for me with him is, you know, yeah, Jack Hughes took a year to get into what we see now. We see the potential from him, but I saw signs of it a year ago. Like you saw the potential already there. You could see everything that was there, and it just wasn't resulting in points or wins or anything like that. But you saw what he could be. And you like, even from the very beginning, I mean, 
everybody, one of the big moments for the Flyers a year ago that everybody talks about is the save Carter Hart made on Taylor Hall. In that very, it was the second game of the season for the Flyers. And the guy who sets up the play is Jack Hughes. And that's good vision. That's hockey sense. That's knowing where a guy is and having the ability to set him up kind of a no look pass and getting it to a guy in a, in a high percentage scoring area with a shot that is able to finish most of the time. And it's an incredible save by a goalie that keeps them off the board ultimately. But that's the thing. Like you saw the potential from Hughes in that situation because he's making that play and he's 18 years old, you know, and that's where Lafreniere is now, but he doesn't have that. And I don't want to call it takeover ability, but it's kind of that way. Like he doesn't have anything right now that made him stand out in these two games. And when I also talk, when I say game flow, by the way, of these two games, I'm not even talking about the way that they move around or they do anything. Both games, there was a lot of penalty calls and it just ruins the flow of five on five. It doesn't give you a chance to really see what a team looks like at even strength either, because they're either killing penalties too often or they're getting too much more power play time than you're used to seeing in a game. Yeah, you because know, the Rangers can look decent. They and they did a week ago, by the way, because Panarin was there and things like that. You can look decent on a power play because you're a man up. You've got some extra ice to work with, and you've if you've got the right skill guys on the ice, which typically they do when you think about Panarin, Zibanejad, um, guys like that, then you've got the potential to still score goals in those situations. When you take Panarin out of the picture, you know even their power play loses something, and then they're killing penalties. You know, you mentioned the eight power plays the Flyers had. One of them was five seconds long at the end of the game. So I kind of discard that one. So I'll go seven, but, but realistically, it shows the stupidity though of a too many men call. How about that? Well, it, well sure. And it was, in a, and it was at a terrible time. I mean, you, you saw everybody. Yeah. And, and I kind of didn't, I didn't notice exactly how many guys were on the ice. Cause I'm trying to follow the play up the ice, but at the same time, it did seem weird to me. I'm like, how are they getting that many guys up on a transition rush <laughs> when, you know, trying to get back into the zone, trying to come back the other yeah, way when, damn, this gap when, when I just, when I thought I just saw <laughs> like three guys in their own zone too. And sure enough, like everybody was yelling and you got it right away. But the, the delay of game penalties and things like that, like those are self-inflicted wounds that you don't need to take. And, you know, I'm not going to sit there and say anything about some of their other penalty calls. I think they took one in the third period on a hooking penalty on Drew after he, uh, he, he stole the puck, so he was going in on a breakaway. All right, you're trying to keep the game within a goal. You take the penalty there and see what happens. That one I'll give you. And but they and, and not only that, but there, there was one, I think they took a penalty 10 seconds after they got scored on on a power play. So, like, you're just setting yourself up to not be able to succeed in this game because you're not giving yourself an opportunity to get back into the game in that sense. So, I mean, yeah. they have a lot of things to work on. I, I think there were people who really thought that the with everything that's going on lately with them, you know, they had, you know, the second pick in the year that and they get Capo Caco and then they have the first pick and they get Lafreniere. And it's like this team's got two really potentially game changing players that are going to enter the lineup almost immediately. They're 18 years old. They're going to just grow from there. And it just hasn't translated at all yet. Yeah, and to your point of the the Rangers having self-inflicted wounds, it did feel like, and I don't want di- to, it, it sucks because it feels like I discredit the Flyers after winning a game 4-3, to three, but it really felt like the Rangers just shot themselves in the foot more than it was, hey, the Flyers really dominated that game. I thought the Rangers sucked so much that it made this Flyers team, because look, this Flyers team, right, they have the win total to satisfy some. But you know, watching this team, and everyone knows who watches this team, that they can't create any offense. They don't know how. They don't know how to, like, they score goals, but on these limited amount of shots where it's not sustainable. You can't keep scoring four goals a night on 20 shots. Like, it, there's just no way. So for them to be able to flow and create offense in the zone and and to look so well entering the zone and Joel Faraby making these great passes and, and everything that we saw last night, I just don't know if that's really because it's who they are because they haven't been for, I don't know, how many games in are they now? 20 or or something like that? They haven't been that once. So is this really them or is this just the Rangers being that putrid? And and I do also want to touch on what you were saying about Lafreniere and I just wonder if he wasn't on this team and let's say he was on, and I'm not going to say the Maple Leafs or or anything insanely top tier, but, that, but, but that's what you were thinking. Well, yeah, well, yeah <laughs> because, like uh, another one that came to my mind was if you played for Pittsburgh, but if you play with Crosby, your points are going to be different. But let's say he played for, I don't know, let, let's say he played on the Bruins, but 
not with that first line, obviously. So now he's he's on a on an organization with a different mindset, a different philosophy, but not playing with Pasta, Bergeron, and um, who am I missing here? Uh, Marshawn. Would would you see a different style of Lafreniere playing, let's say, third line minutes or second line minutes on the Boston Bruins team? Which, which I don't know. Would would that change what we think of him in year one? Yeah, so you want to put him with a guy like Charlie Coyle, you're saying. Like, if you sure. played alongside of a Charlie Coyle, what would it look like? Sure. Um, well, I think system goes into it a little bit because the the Bruins play with an intensity that's pretty much unmatched in this division. You know, they don't stop playing no matter what the score is, no matter what the situation is. And you saw that in, in the Lake Tahoe game. Just because it was 6-2 didn't mean they were letting up by any stretch. And, I, and they didn't care that the Flyers didn't have half of their lineup. They didn't care that there's, you know, it's a national audience. They're going to play their game. They're going to do whatever they want to, and they're going to just keep going because they don't know anything else regardless. But the only thing that they could do differently in that game is probably once you get to the third period, you don't have to lean on the top line. They do still too often, in my opinion, because there's too many games I've seen. And, and believe me, you know, part of what you're talking about when it comes to evaluating the flyer season at 16 games is, you know, and I'll even go back before the Ranger game a night ago. In, in you know, you're, when you play 15 games and a third of your games are against a team that just has your number one way or another every single time, it's going to look bad. You know, I, I've played this game already with take away the numbers from the Boston games and the Flyers are a perfectly legitimate team. You know, I mean, they're 9-1-1 yeah. one and one but, against yeah, everybody in, else. Yeah, I know. And, I know. and they're 0-3-2 three and two against Boston. And they've yet to play Boston with their full, true full lineup. You know, they've either played without Sean Couturier. They've played without half of their lineup. It, it is what it is. And granted, one of the other things that's different about these games, I feel like we'd have a totally different perspective. And a lot of people in Philadelphia would have a different perspective on the Flyers against the Bruins if they would have just finished off one of those games where they led in the third period, just one of them, even if you're, and I'm not saying that it, it makes it all better, but just to show that you could so that this way you can lean on the excuse of don't have your full lineup with the COVID situation going to Lake Tahoe. So throw that one out. And it's like you're one and three against them in the four games. And one of them was. Does that change a, the way you think about this Flyers team, though? When you take away those numbers, do you do you feel differently knowing that it's really just the Bruins causing them trouble? And the only reason why I can't go down that road is there's no way. And if there is, uh, it would be the most magical Stanley Cup ever in the history of the world. But there is no way when watching this team that this decor can win anything. The defensive zone is so bad. And poor Carter Harden, and I want to touch on him because I think 50% of it is him because he's been flat out horrible at times and there's no denying it. He's young and he's going to learn. And I saw a great tweet that, look, the Flyers with a 22-year-old goalie before made a pretty tough decision to move on and that guy ended up winning two Vesnas. So let's not pull the trigger too early on this kid can't play. But I do think that he sucked. I think a product of that is everything in front of him with this decor. While their record might not show you that they are bad outside of the Boston Bruins, and even with the Boston Bruins, their record tells you they're not bad. I have no clue how they can do any damage with this decor and D zone. It just makes no sense to me. Well, I, I go back to the fact that they haven't had a full lineup a lot of the time because that's the hard part for me. I I want to evaluate this team the way that I should by covering them. But I find it hard to do that because I don't have a full picture of what they look like with guys with certain guys in the lineup or just in general with, you know, like I want to see them play. And one of the things I'm really hoping for, and I thought this last night while I was covering a game because I saw a lot of people sitting there calling out the penalty kill, calling out guy, you know, assistant coaches and it's happening on both sides of special teams. They go out and they did score two power play goals, which helps to be a difference in Should've a game. Had yeah. four. Well, <laughs> I hear you, but <laughs> and, 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 five and, on three. Come on, right. and all Swedish, uh, no finish. Well, and look, I will give them credit for good zone time there because there's times where I've watched them on a five on three and they don't even get set up. So I'll give them credit for getting Baby in. The, well, and not only that, but you know, there were two at least two chances I saw, and I think Shesterkin made saves on both that 
it looked like they were going to find a way to finish off of him, and they were not able to because you got robbed by the goalie. He had, you know, for a 4-3 game, it's an, it was an underrated goalie matchup because of the fact that there were a lot of great saves from both ends where this could have, I mean, this had the potential to be a 6-5 game, not a 4-3 game, and it, it wasn't. So give both goalies credit in that regard. But I saw a lot of stuff about, you know, like I believe I saw comments on Twitter during the game of is, has any team ever fired two assistants midseason without firing the head coach or whatever and things like that. And it's like, look, when it came to the penalty kill, at least, and I'm going to throw this in my takeaways later, but I might as well reference it now, too, because it's something that I drew up really quickly because I started to wonder. So when the Flyers play. Anybody else not named the Boston Bruins, at least, you know, going into the game last night, I think they were 29 for 36 on the penalty kill, which is an 80.6 rating or something like that or percentage. And that's perfectly acceptable. Like that, do you realize like, like that moves them up so high in the state, like in where they are in the rank. If you just look at those now against Boston, they're eight for 16. So they're at 50%. So there's a team that just knows how to expose you Here's how, even this, more. Here's why I have a little issue with taking away the Bruins. Because right. the Bruins are the best. Like, the Bruins are what you want to be. The Bruins is the sure. standard almost. So take away what, you, you know, what the ceiling. It's the standard of making playoff runs and being legitimate. Not the standard in, in terms of league average, obviously. They're way better than that. But if you look at them, that's what you want to become. So if you can't stop that, you're far away from being that. And if you can't score like that, which uh, most people can't, but that just shows you how far off you are on your power play. So it's hard for me to take away from that. Well, no, and the reason I keep doing it now is because, it, again, what my my take on it is is that if that's a third of your season, though, then it's like, well, if you didn't have to, it's the way the scheduling is is my is my problem because normally you would not play a third of your games, fifteen games into a season against the same team, but they have this time. So now, the, going into last night, so if they played fifteen games, then you're still looking at or even at sixteen because then you're looking at forty more games on your schedule and you play that team three more times and you play everybody else. 37, you know, or in this case, I guess it would have been 38 after the first 15 out of, you know, so 38 out of 41 games left on your schedule are against everybody else who you've competed with, who you've been able to hang with. And it's going to be like, I'm talking about it from an overall numbers spectrum. Definitely what you're saying is correct. When it comes down to it, when you play that team, which I believe based on everything and it, believe me, it's all up in the air because they've rescheduled some of these games three times over, but you play them, I believe, three times in the same week in April. That, to me, has to be treated like a miniature playoff series. And if you don't like the way things go in the first game in Boston, you come back the next night and on home ice, and you make things harder on them. You have to treat it like your season's on the line right there, even if it's not. you know. And there's a pretty good chance that based on what, how long of a gap between playing them from Lake Tahoe to April will be, there's a pretty good chance that they could be the one and two in the division at that point because the Flyers seem to have good success against just about everybody else. And I'll give you everything you're saying about them. They're finding ways to win games that I don't even know how they're finding ways to win games. I will totally vouch for that. But I'm hoping that what I'm hoping for is that something just balances out one way or another. And and it, it could be good or bad is, is my point. Like, I want to see it balance out one way or another. Either it's going to completely catch up with you and you're going to become the team that you've been in the first 15 and it's going to show based on your record and the way that you finish games or you're going to start to get better like like you did against the Rangers. And I get the I get it. The Rangers are not one of the good teams in the division. But, you know, playing with half of your lineup, you did exactly what you still should have done to that team. You found a way to win a game while there's guys who are missing who you know would have probably put you over the top. Imagine if you had all those power play opportunities and you're playing and Jake Voracek's out there and Travis Konechny's out there and they're yeah, getting you know what shot you're doing? The, the The puck's getting sent back into your defensive zone and you're going to try six times to try and enter the zone because they don't know how. That's what would have <laughs> happened. Uh, but I do want to, uh, before we look more into some of these other teams in the Eastern Conference right now, because it's a battle, even though it's not shocking, we knew it would be. There's a lot of teams in play. I want to touch on Joel Faraby because yeah. this kid has seriously made we, – we, you mentioned Jack Hughes and how in his first year didn't live up to insane expectations, but you did see enough of, all right, look, there is a tool set there. He, he has those intangibles. Now it's about 
getting that experience, growing the mental side of the game, the IQ, and then, of course, the physicality part. He needed to beef up and get a little bit bigger, but Jack Hughes has taken that jump. With Joel Farabee, last year, you, I, I feel like it's a very similar situation of, you know, you knew that something was in there. When you watch him play, he has that it factor in him. Like, this kid can play, but he had a lot to learn. He definitely had to beef up. He had to gain experience to, to recognize, okay, next time I come down the wall, I can do this and that because the last Last time I tried this, I got blown up, or whatever the case may be. Joel Faraby has taken the, this monster step to the point where he might be my favorite player to watch on this team. Like I'm enjoying Claude Giroux, but that's because of a. I know there's not that much time left, and he's playing great this season. He's moving the puck well, getting a lot of assists. So I'm enjoying it from the dad strength level of of Claude Giroux. <laughs> but Joel Faraby. The kid's a stud. I mean, the kid is a flat-out stud, and I know he was he was supposed to be, and we know that in the Braden Shen trade. I think both teams won it because Morgan Frost and Joel Faraby, and they get a cup out of it, and Braden Shen's a key piece. I think both teams win it, but, man, I, I, I just love Joel Faraby. I think he's just a fantastic, fantastic player, and there's so much room to even get better, too, which is the scary part. I don't even think they tapped into the full potential yet. Well, you already know that, that he was my pick to be the breakout player this year for this team. Mine was Nolan Patrick. I feel like an idiot. <laughs> well, that's a whole nother discussion at this point. But, you know, he was my pick to be the breakout player for this team. And he has he's delivered on just about every level in, in that sense. And he's becoming one of those guys that's fun to watch. I, I think of him almost in a similar vein to Travis Konechny in a sense that people got really behind him because he was starting to be this guy who showed you you know, look, I actually have a shot that's capable of doing something and I can be an energy level player and even, and size doesn't matter because uh, I'll find a way to be better and make the most of my opportunities when I get there. And he, look, he had a partial breakaway, maybe started to lose a step toward the end of it, but had a partial breakaway in the second period and tried to make a pass instead of trying to just go for it and charge up the middle and maybe get an opportunity. But you want, to me, it's the other one later on. He has a breakaway in the third period coming out of the penalty box and just turns it on and hits this new gear. You know, he's he's not the fastest player on the ice every single night, but he can hit that gear. His shot is outstanding. And I think that the big thing, too, is you look at the goal that was scored by Van Riemsdyk in the game last night and you go, look at the vision he has. He yeah. can do that, too. So. You know, he didn't get a goal in this in this particular game, so he's still on eight, which is the same mark that he had a year ago in his rookie year. But he's going to get there. He's going to get to 10 or more. He's going to quite possibly challenge for 20 in a shortened season. You know what's which crazy? Kinda... He stood out to me last night more than anybody else. And when I looked at the stat sheet afterwards, I was like, not blown away, but I was like, huh, really? Like, that's all he had? Uh, I thought he was buzzing that much out there. I saw him flying around. Now, of course, Giroux stood out. Like, players stood out to me. But when I was watching last night, I swear to God, Joel Farabee, 86. It was like every time I saw him out there, my eyes were just glued. He, he was that recognizable to me. Yeah, and, and not only that, but I think you've seen one of the great things you've seen from him over the last two, three games specifically. And I'll even lump Lake Tahoe into this. And I know Lake Tahoe was, from a Flyers perspective, kind of just a, an overall disaster. But he's got he has jump and can provide you with something that sparks you for a while. Like they're playing without half of the lineup for these last three games. You're down a goal to the Rangers, trying to get anything out of this first game back. You've had maybe a day or two of practice. It's not really a good situation to still be in because you're playing a game with almost no ice time in the previous week. The Rangers had played games. So if you lose that game, there's kind of an understanding of why it was possible to happen. But you're looking to try to get something out of it because for most of the game, it looks like it's there. It's within reach. You can find a way to get something. And he's the guy who makes the heads up play is keeping an eye on where the puck is in that situation and finds a way to score the goal and gets it to overtime. And you get a point out of that. So he's able to come. He's the one who comes up with the timely goal. And you think about the Lake Tahoe game and they're trailing one nothing early, but they come down, they get the game tied. They eventually took the lead in the first period, which I, I'm sure that's hard to believe when you look at the final score. but. They did lead this game for a few brief moments in the first period, but he gets the first goal. And, and again, it's his speed. It's his opportunistic approach to the game where he just shoots right up the middle and takes advantage of a bounce. I believe it was another one of these cross, uh, you know, 
cross corner dump ins here where he just goes and reads the play really well. It comes back into the right spot and he's going right at it. They love catches. that play, huh? They, they do. Yeah, they did I was, it to Raffle I was gonna the point other it night, out. right? They did yeah, they did it with Raffle and they've done it, they've done it a couple times in general. Like I think I saw them try it at least three, four times in the game last night, too, where they just kind of go to it a little bit. The, the key to them doing that is that they need to be able to win that battle. And now against the Rangers, I really saw it. They've done it a couple of other times. Like they were winning. The, the reason they had the lead in the first period of the Lake Tahoe game is because they were winning battles in the beginning. They were actually winning races to pucks. They were harder on pucks and they were winning some of those one-on-one -on -one battles that you needed to, to get into position to take advantage of something. And that's, that's because the that's sun was in win. the eyes of the Bruins that period. So they got a little lucky. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, I'll give you that too. Yeah, but nonetheless, Joel Faraby is a really fun player to watch. And you, you know what? I'll throw this in too about him. I've liked him since the day he was drafted. And there was just, you know, I rem I when I previewed that draft year, I'm, I, when I knew where the Flyers were picking, obviously they were picking at 14 there. That was a guy I had at the top of the list. I'm thinking he's a guy who could be there. He's a guy who fits everything that they probably need right now. They've drafted defensively. They've drafted other guys at forward who you think can be total package type of guys. But this was the guy who I think had the offensive package that you wanted to be a guy who could step in and showcase that he's got a shot and showcase that he's got that offensive prowess and that playmaking ability, but also that finishing ability that they really needed and could grow into that role. And he's done all of that in maybe a matter of three years. You know, he was drafted, he played one year in college, and then he was off to the pros. And another one of these types of guys, he, he kind of falls into the same level as a Carter Hart, where the amount of time that you spend at the pro level before you got that call was very minimal. Like you, you just impressed so much at the pro level just uh, even in the minor leagues that it was impossible not to call you up. And then you got here and you just continued to look the part. So you weren't going back and he's definitely, you know, he's definitely a fixture of this team. Now I don't see any reason why you wouldn't be. And I, you know, I've thought about this a lot because they're going to get guys back over the next few days. They're going to get back to that full strength lineup somewhere down the road in the next week or so. Probably. I don't know that I'm touching the line he's on. You know, he's on a line right now with Sean Couturier and James Van Riemsdyk, and they've probably collectively been your three best players all season. So I don't even know if I'm touching that. I think that you leave that alone. Well, would you, you leave alone that, ha that Hayes, Giroud, Nolan, Patrick line? Because they were buzzing as well out there. And, and look, it could be a product of who they were playing against, but does Nolan Patrick need a spark? Get out of that third line center role. Stop worrying about, you still worry about the D zone as a winger, but the, 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 the intensity of the D zone isn't as big when you're on the wing. And playing with someone like Giroud and playing with someone like Hayes, is this an opportunity for him to just get out of the funk, go play with some top six guys, and, and maybe that opens up your game more? I, I just, you got to do something to get Nolan Patrick going more. He's been underwhelming. Yeah, uh, you know, I got it. I got asked a question like, just in a group chat that I was in about what I thought or how did he look in the game? Cause everybody was talking about how great Giroux looked and it was his first game back. He had, you know, I even made the comment on Twitter. I think that, you know, Claude Drew had one day of practice and a morning skate and came out and just had three assists on his first night back, you know, no big deal. You know, like as if, you know, you think he wasn't motivated to come back after sitting around for two weeks doing nothing, you know, like absolutely. You know, I called Nolan Patrick's game a mixed bag because I thought that he had some good moments from a positioning standpoint. That line was doing a lot of good things. But the the area that I had trouble with is there's a lot of times where he's in the right spot. And and I, I thought that this was a really good, you know, Elaine Vigneault said something very similar that I thought was very good also. he's His positioning is fine. He never does anything too wrong from a positioning standpoint. It's more or less that he's either think I, I call it thinking the game too fast almost because he tries to make this simple play or, or not even simple. He tries to make this really creative play that in his mind probably is simple, but it's not to the rest of the team. So he's trying, you know, drop passes between the legs and a teammate's not ready to pick it up. So it's, it, so it's a turnover. It's not a completed pass, things like that. I see that a lot from him. And sometimes I don't know if that's just him thinking the game too fast and assuming that everybody else is thinking on the same level he is, or that he's just not on the same page with everybody else. It's probably, that's the it's hard probably part the latter of the two. Yeah, it probably, because it happens too frequently. If it happened once every, you know, every so often, then you go, all right, you're trying something, maybe you force it there a little bit, but you don't do it every single time. He really does it a lot. 
What I saw last night that was different is instead of him trying to be the guy to set it up, is he was the guy who could have been on the receiving end of some of some really good opportunities and call it, you know, call it something that he's doing. Maybe he's just, you know, gripping the stick too tight and it's in his hands at this point, or maybe it's just bad luck. But the puck's hopping on him a lot. He's in a spot where he's in the right spot to maybe get a good opportunity. And it never seems to sit for him. And that's the uh that's that's the things you have to overcome. And I I, I don't want to bury, you know, I never want to bury him too much because of how much time he's had off. But I keep starting to get to that point where I go, you got to turn it around at some point in this season and start to do more than just be a guy who's out there. You know, his positioning's fine. I don't think that he does anything that takes away from their game per se. Like I, I, you know, but he is, you know, he can be a defensive liability at times is, you know, and I, I don't love to use plus minus as everything, but his oh, plus minus plus, is not I'm very pl- good. I'm a plus minus. If you're a center and you're a defenseman, plus minus is valuable. Well, Take it from uh, nah, a guy I mean, who was minus 365 in his career. No, nah, I'm just kidding. I wasn't one, one for every day of the year. No, That's where you're no, going. I'll, <laughs> come on. I, I I had my tough moments, but anyway, where were we? No, <laughs> no but uh, <laughs> talking but, talking about your playing days. Yeah, oh, the glory days. As I'm looking at my jerseys hanging up on the wall. Um, look, we'll <laughs> we'll we'll train this just real quickly when looking at the standings. I do want to touch on the Eastern Conference just a little yeah. bit, but we'll wrap it up here uh, pretty shortly. But Boston's in the lead with 24. Washington 22 and look the games played are a little bit different they're within one or two games of each other but the point totals of the first five teams in this division 24 22 21 21 21 Uh, right now in in a very very way too early prediction if you had to guess that one team out of the playoffs who would it be the Islanders the Penguins the Flyers I think it's safe to say Boston's going to make the playoffs I feel very confident in Washington too so who do you think that one team out of the first four is going to be? I'll give you my top four in the East from the beginning of the year, what I thought it was going to play out to be. And I had I had Boston, Philly, Islanders, Capitals. That was the four that I had. And now I think Pittsburgh could still I, – I, I had a tough time picking between Washington and Pittsburgh. I will say that. So the five that I thought were going to be there are exactly the five that are there right now. I, I think you're right. I think it's safe to say Boston's in. You know, I don't see anything happening there. Washington intrigues me because of the fact that they're only one point up on these other three. And I kind of, you know, I'm not going to sit there and call it completely suspect, but I'm interested in their goaltending at this point. Because yeah. I'm watching, you know, you know what? I'm watching as I'm sitting here watching some of these other games. I'm seeing the updates on Ilya Samsonov and the minors just trying to get some conditioning work in. And I don't know if it just means that their minor league team is that bad or that he's having struggles, but he's given up something like four goals in minor league games. And that's a scary thought, you know, for them. And I, and then, and my question to that is because I think that Vitek Vanacek has given them a lot right now and he's helped keep them where they are. And he's won a lot of games for them this year. But I, I, I wonder if that's sustainable over the course of a longer season. Uh, you know, the flyers need to get more games in against everybody else for me to really know if they're going to hang there or not. I, I think they've got all the potential in the world to do so because they seem to play well against everybody else. That's not named the Boston Bruins. Uh, Pittsburgh's an intriguing one because they've gotten a boost from everything going on with the GM situation and it's sparked them. But how long does that spark last before it kind of comes back to being what it is? You have to fix where you have to fix the problems on the ice to an extent. The Islanders are really one of the teams that intrigues me as well because of the fact that, you know, going into the games on Wednesday, the Islanders were the only other team besides the Bruins in the division that had a positive goal differential. The Flyers were at even, I think, and the Islanders were plus one. That's wild. That's a, that's a yeah. wild stat. It really is. And that, that kind of blows me away a little bit. But I see. I find it interesting because I'm looking at it even as of as of Thursday morning as we're as we're talking about this. And Buffalo's only a minus six, and yet they're at the bottom of the division. I mean, a minus. They're ready six to blow this thing up. They're ready to well, do it. They're going to trade Eichel. They're ready to do it. It's well, unbelievable. That, but, but the reason, but the reason that I the reason I bring up the fact that they're only a minus six is because they're okay. They're at the bottom of the division. I could go look at anybody else. The Ottawa Senators are a minus 32. The Detroit Red Wings are a minus 27, you know? Yeah, that's a the good Ana- point. It puts the you Anaheim in perspective. Ducks are a minus 18. This is, you know, there are teams that have made the playoffs at a minus six. 
because yeah. they get lucky in a lot of other situations or they where they win their games so much bigger that when they lose a cut or they lose their games so big, I should say that when they win their games and they're all close, all right, the goal differential doesn't balance out, but you want a lot of games and you got blown out in two of them and that caused the differential. You know, like that's half of the Flyers battle is okay, six one to Buffalo, six one to Boston, seven three to Boston. It's a lot of your goal differential right there. They're winning all of the other games. And usually, you know, they've won a couple of them lately, you know, overtimes and, you know, one goal victories and things like that. But they're winning a lot of them. They were winning a lot of them early in the year by two or three goals every single time when it came down to it. So I'm curious to see, how, you know, even, even Washington. I mentioned, you know, one of the things I mentioned about Washington is their goaltending situation, like I said, and how they try to figure out that and navigate through that because I don't know where Samsonov is and I don't know if he's going to come back the sharpest. I don't know if Vanacek's going to keep up his pace. They've got Craig Anderson down there, but that's, you know, even that little bit of time he came in in relief when he played against the Flyers the other week, he didn't look outstanding by any stretch. You know, no, he a, looked that's, like a a guy, desp- that's a desperation move. Yeah. He looked like a guy who hadn't played in a year, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. So, you know, they're a minus three goal differential, and I could only, you know, I could see that actually getting worse at, at some point just because it does seem like they allow a good number of goals. I mean, that was a wild game they played against the Flyers where it's seven to four, you know, like that's just, you know, I don't think that that's common for them, but, you know, I think you, you did see the potential that they could get into one of those types of games. And if they do, that they don't have, I mean, they should have the firepower to win games like that, but they also really don't have the same def- defense that they've had over the years. I think they've, you know, look, adding Zidane Char is a great piece, and I'm sure that he's got something left in his career. I'm not trying to say he's done completely if he's playing, because he's playing and they're still winning games. I'm not saying that, but he still is what he is in his 40s, you know? Like, he he's not going to be your go-to guy. And John Carlson hasn't always been, you know, he's, a good defensive player, but I don't think he's, he's on the level of elite defenseman, like, like elite defenseman in terms of he puts up a lot of points and he does a lot of those things. Well, so he's a Norris candidate all the time. Cause he's got the offensive side to go with the defensive side, but I don't think his defensive game is on the level of a Victor Hedman, you know, and guys like that, just strictly talking own zone play. He's made mistakes in the past that I've seen where you go, that's just a really poor defensive zone play. You know, so that's where I get, that's what I get from him sometimes. But I think that I still, I still kind of hold to my four. I think that Pittsburgh's the one that I keep finding to be the wild card because Pittsburgh seems to, you know, very much like we had talked about earlier in the show where, oh, Boston has the Flyers number. And that's part of why we're talking the way we are because they've played five games against Boston. Pittsburgh's played Washington a lot and Pittsburgh keeps winning against Washington. It seems like they just know how to beat that team. So I, I find that curious as well. Like, there's certain teams out there that you just know how to play. I I felt that way, you know, even in some of the worst years the Flyers had, they always seemed to know how to hang with Washington. Even though Washington was this team that was definitely in a higher class than they were those years. They just always seemed to know how to at least hang with them to be competitive against them and make things interesting. And, you know, uh, that maybe that's me seeing a lot of that team over the years. Cause I've watched, I don't know how many games against Washington in person over the years. It's a lot. You know, I can tell you it's a lot. There's there's teams I've seen more often than others. And, you know, so that's just one of those cases. But yeah, I think I think you're seeing the five that, you know, this is the five that's going to be battling it out for the rest of the year. You know, and this is you know now we're getting into the good part of it, I think, because now that we're getting down to it, I think that now also, you know, one of the things we slightly hinted at when we were talking about the Flyers that we didn't really hint at when it came to some of these others is that, you know, the Flyers weren't the only team in, in the division to have a COVID situation and to lose a lot of games and now have to make up a lot of games as a result. So everybody in this division is going to be playing a ton in the last two months of the season. And that just sets the stage for some really good hockey because of the fact that it's going to go back and forth so many times. I think every single team in this division, one at one point or another, Boston included, is going to have a stretch where you go, what's going on with this team? Here's two or three games where I don't know what they're doing. I don't know why it's not working out for them. And they're going to have stretches where they're putting together four and four in a row, you know, and winning games left and right because they're finding a way to do it. I think every team is going to find a way to do that at some point. And it's going to make the standings even better because two wins in a row against the same team changes everything this year. So that's what I'm eager to see as it moves forward. 
Yeah, no, definitely. I'm, I'm right there with you. And uh, the Capitals, not like it's crazy because all these teams seem to be where they uh, have championship caliber squads, but they're on the downside of them. So which team is still going to have enough juice to hold them into it? And I think the Capitals, while they're not the team that they used to be, and they're not that insane level of powerhouse, I do believe that there's enough still left in the tank for them to to be able to efficiently stay involved here. And the Penguins, that's the one that's that's more interesting to me. And like, what's going on with the Islanders? Not enough firepower. You have Barzell, Anders Lee, but everyone talks about their scheme, their scheme, their scheme, Barry Trotz. Do they have enough of that actual legit firepower to to kind of make it happen? They're always involved, but they're not hoisting the Stanley Cup for a reason, so everyone always asks, is there enough star power there? And only time will tell, but with that being said, this is the perfect time to uh, end episode four. We're going to be on episode five next week. Crazy how time (laughs) flies by here, but uh, yeah, thank you guys so much for listening to this episode. There's nothing better than talking some puck. And uh, we will see you all next time.